Good evening, everyone. Let's start with hymn number 495. Number 495, if you need it, count your many blessings. Let's stand and sing that together. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged in the Wednesday night service here. Um, obviously, Pastor is is not here today, so he's having um, some some health problems. He wasn't wasn't feeling well at all tonight. So let's keep that in our prayers. It must be, you know, somewhat serious for Pastor not to be here. I think in the three year, three and a half years, I don't remember him missing a service for being sick, and so he's not not feeling too good. So, Brother Josh, if you would open us in prayer and pray for our Pastor as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Remain standing, hymn number 352. We'll sing all three verses, hymn number 352, Look and Live. I have a message from the Lord, hallelujah, the message unto you I give.
Thank you.
Sing all three verses, hymn number 135, Before I Loved Him. Lost in the darkness, I stumbled alone, far from the sunlight of day. Then Jesus found me and made me his own. Darkness away. Before I loved him, he loved me. Before I found him, he found me. Before I sought him, he sought for me. Yes, Jesus cares for me. Chilled in the shadows, I wandered in that is. Wow, he was thinking of us long before we thought of him. Praise God. And that's why we're here. You may be seated. Brother Page, come preach for us. Well, I'm glad to be with you tonight, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to stand in this pulpit. And uh, to be with you, it's been a real privilege for my wife and I over these last few months. And we praise the Lord for you and thank you for your friendship and your encouragement. And I'm so grateful for Brother Shoemaker and his dear wife and for the work God's given them to do here for their sons and their faithfulness and your faithfulness. And we're, again, honored to be here uh, and to serve the Lord in this place is a, is a privilege and uh, let's be praying for your pastor. He has, I know he had a very, very, very busy day yesterday, a lot on his shoulders and uh, a burden he's always willing to carry, uh, but he's a man and he needs our prayers. His wife needs our prayers and uh, we love them and praise the Lord for them and praise the Lord for you. Uh, where we have been over the last many years before we came to Greenville is at, in Knoxville, Tennessee. By the way, that's where our grandbaby is. Uh, our son's also there, but uh, we're not so concerned about our son. We're, we're concerned about Josie. Josie's the major concern of life at this moment. Uh, but uh, we spent a lot of time at Crown College. You might have heard of Crown College and, and Clarence Sexton. Pastor Sexton has been a great influence in our lives. And uh, my pastor is Steve Smith. Uh, Steve Smith is uh, the pastor at Good News Baptist Church in Candler, North Carolina. He came down to Tabernacle years and years and years ago and studied at Tabernacle, and he led me to the Lord when I was 18 years old. I shared this testimony on Sunday morning in Sunday school. Uh, when I was 18 years old, that was 36 years ago tonight. I got saved January the 29th of 1984. 
And I just thank God that when he saved me, uh, he, he just did such a miraculous work in my heart and my life. And I've never gotten over it. Never will I get over it. I was a lost, pretty good little Southern Baptist boy trying to do the right things, trying to pray the right prayers and do all those things, but I was lost. Uh, but I'm so glad that God was seeking me. And God is still seeking sinners. And uh, I praise his name for that. I want you to take your Bible tonight and go with me to the book of Luke. The gospel according to Luke. And I'm going to share a thought with you, a passage that you're very familiar with. I'm sure you've read it many, many times. You've probably heard a lot of messages preached out of this short little passage I'm going to read tonight. And I'm going to share some things with you. I believe that the word of God uh, is very vivid about the one thing I believe every church needs most. The one thing every church needs most. That's the title of the message tonight. The one thing every church needs most. If I were to ask you to take a list tonight and, and write out a list, what does our church need most? I dare say we have a lot of responses. We need a, a new kitchen, some of the ladies may say. The young people say, we need a gym. Yeah, we need go-karts. Yeah, we need, oh, we need, there's a lot of things we need, we, we think we need. You might make a list. But I want to share with you the things, uh, the, the one thing that every church needs most. In the book of Luke, chapter number, uh, chapter number 10, verse number 38, I'm going to read just a few, a few verses here to you. Again, a very familiar passage that you'll know. <clears throat> now, it came to pass as they went that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Before I even continue reading, I want you to realize something tonight. God is a very certain God. And our God knows exactly what he's doing at all moments of life, our lives. Our God knows exactly what we need, when we need it. And he is certainly going to take care of you. Think about that word certain. Years ago, it was the year, oh, tw what was that year? Um, 20, that would have been the year 2012. When President Obama was reelected. Does anybody remember that night? Were you pretty excited about that night? No. No, most of us probably weren't real excited. You, maybe you were. Most of us probably weren't real excited about that night. Well, that night was a Tuesday night, and he was reelected, which was just a little, a little mind-boggling to most Christians. We thought it wouldn't happen, but it happened. And even as Christians, we, uh, we were just a little upset, burdened. We were in church that following night on Wednesday night, a night like this, the night after the election. And Pastor Sexton, we were there in Knoxville that, during that time, and Pastor Sexton was away preaching a meeting. He came in, uh, but he came on uh, before the church. He came on the screen, and he, he rem remotely gave us a message, just a brief message, and he said this, you're upset. Everybody is has a clouded mind. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on in America and where we're going to go over these next many years, where we've already come from, where we're going. But he said, I want to remind you, church, we have a certain future. And wow, it was like the demons fled. That's such a sweet promise. You have a certain future. I want you to see this word again. We find it a couple of times here in this first verse, verse 38 that I read to you. Now, it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. If you mark in your Bible, and I recommend that you do mark things in your Bible that, are, that impact your life, 
Mark that phrase, if you would, in verse number 42. One thing is needful. One thing is needful. And again, I want to call your attention tonight to this one thing that every church needs most. We'll find that here. The one thing every church needs most. Think about who's speaking these words. The Lord Jesus Christ. The author, the finisher of your faith and my faith. The creator and sustainer of all things. The inventor of this thing we call the church. His bride, the glorious bride of Christ on this earth here to carry out his purpose and his plan, soon to be married with him. We're going to be with him. We have a certain future. We are the bride of the Lord Jesus. He's speaking these words. And it's not a harsh rebuke that he's giving this lady. See, he came because he had something to do for her and for others because he does things very purposely. The things that have happened to you in your life over the last 24 hours or 24 months or 24 years, God has a purpose and a plan. God cares about every single detail of your life. Years ago, I was struggling with what God had for us in ministry. I was just, Lord, where do you want us to go? What is it? What do you want? Where, I just want to be in your will. And I ran across Proverbs 16, 9. That verse says, a man's heart deviseth his way. I, if I were to ask you now, do you want to be in God's way? I think most everybody would say, yeah, I want to be in God's way. I don't want to be out of God's way. I want to be in God's way. But that's somewhat general. The verse says, a man's heart deviseth his way. But the second part of that verse is very precious. But the Lord directeth his steps. That means every single step. God knows exactly what I need and what you need. He's a very certain God. He has a purpose and a plan for what you've been through and where you're going. He does so because he loves you so sincerely as his own child. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we see these characters come to light. Mary and Martha, there, there's this contrast. Uh, I carry a Schofield Bible, you, maybe you do, and, and Brother Schofield wrote this note, Mary and Martha, in contrast. We see them in a different background, and we, so we see them in a different light. We see their personality, their persona, how they go about doing things. And if you have a, anybody have siblings, is it not amazing? We have three sons, and they are, they're 31 and 28 and, and 24. They were raised the same way in the same home. We, we homeschooled using a Becca video, they had, so they had a lot of the same teachers. They were raised in the same church with the same parents, but they're so different. It's so amazing. The things they like, the things they dislike, it's crazy. Their DNA is similar, but they're so different. We see these two sisters, just dynamically different women in the way that they approach this one named Jesus Christ. In verse number 38, the Bible says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. So guess who's coming over tonight? God Almighty is going to visit our home tonight. You ladies would absolutely go crazy. I married a wonderful lady. Now, they say that men will marry their mom. And, and girls will marry their dads. Now, my wife is not just like my mom, but she's a working woman. My mom's a working woman. I mean, always diligent, always working, always busy. And it almost can drive you crazy because they're always working. They're always going. When they're up, everybody's up. You know what that means? When, you, when they're walking through the hallway, you know it's time to get up. I might as well get up because I can't sleep anymore. I hear the clop, 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 clop. They're always working. They're working women. Martha said... The Son of God is coming to my home. She's going to have a guest. It's not just anybody. The Son of God is going to come to her home. I'm going to give you three points. If you want to take notes, that's fine. If, don't, if you don't take notes, that's okay as well. But the point number one is very simple. The one thing that our churches need most. Now we can talk about other churches and all their entertainment and all of their pizzazz and all the things that they're doing and all the programs they have. As a pastor, I've been called so many times, 
Pastor, can I ask you what, do you, what kind of program you have for my children? Pastor, can I ask you how you're going to entertain my little babies? Pastor, can I, can I ask you what all you're going to do for me? That's the kind of questions that pastors get because that's kind of what we fostered in, in the church in this day. We, we talk about the churches and what they need and what, they, what they're trying to accomplish in their ministry. But there's one thing that is needful. One thing that every church needs most. Point number one. The one thing we need most is God as our guest. We don't need programs the most. We don't need nice facilities the most. We don't need all the things we think we need the most. Because, see, if we'll give Jesus Christ preeminence, He will place everything else in order. When we place Jesus Christ as the head of our homes and our marriages, on our jobs, in our churches, He will place everything else in order. And just mark it down. When we place Him somewhere below being preeminent, everything else gets out of order. Because He is the I Am. He is the Son of God. He is the King of kings. And He deserves preeminence. The one thing the Lord Jesus Christ told Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen. One thing is needful. God as our guest. We love to come fellowship. We enjoy shaking hands here on Sunday morning and Sunday night. We enjoy the, 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 the hand around the shoulder, uh, the time to get, to get together and pray and to share burdens and to be in Sunday school and to have fellowships. And by the way, we love to eat. It's fun to eat. I'm a Baptist to the core. Talk about some fried chicken, let's eat. It's fun to eat, but these activities, the, the fellowship and the fun and the growing together and all these things, they're all good. But they're not what's most important. One thing is needful. You think about your ministry, what you're doing and your ministry in this church. Maybe it's Pick one of many. It's music. It's teaching. It's ushering. It's cleaning. It's singing. It's giving. But one thing is needful. One thing is most preeminent. When we come here together with God's people, He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we come here, oh, the fringe benefits are wonderful. But we come here to worship the King of Kings. That is the one thing that's most needful that we should never forget when we open these doors and walk in this church and this building together with God's people. He said He's here with us. God is our guest, by the way. Because He said where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Anybody ever heard of the Saddle Ridge Horde? The Saddle Ridge Horde is the name given to identify a treasure trove of 1,427 gold coins unearthed in the gold country in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California in 2013. Due to privacy concerns, the exact location of the discovery has not been disclosed, other than, just other than to confirm that the land is located in a hillside area of the gold country near the site of the gold rush of 1849. As of 2014, a couple discovered this hoard and have chosen remain, to remain anonymous. So they're known only as John and Mary. This couple, have, they've lived in this rural property for several years and they had no idea that somebody buried coins that happened to be on their property. They wish to keep their identity, identity location and ownership history of their home private in order to keep treasure seekers from trespassing on their property and in an effort to find more gold. John and Mary discovered this, this treasure trove while they were walking their dog on their property. 
Although they had reportedly hiked the trail numerous times previously, it was not until they spotted a rust-covered metal can poking out of the ground that they chose to explore a little bit further. Before finding this treasure trove, the couple had noticed some, some unique features in the area. They recalled seeing an old empty can hanging from an old tree. The can had evidently been there so long that the tree had literally grown around it. At the time, the couple surmised that the hanging can had possibly been used to hold flowers and mark a grave. They also noticed an oddly shaped rock on a hill nearby, which was nicknamed Saddle Ridge. After they found the gold, they realized that the geographical features in the hanging, the hanging can were probably markers to the site, maybe placed there by the original owners of their property. After Mary noticed the can, John bent down to pick it up, but found that it was stuck in the dirt. He began to use a piece of wood to pry it out of the ground. It was so heavy that they, had to, that they, had, they thought they had lead paint in that can. On their walk back to the house, they struggled to carry the weight uh, the, the, they struggled to carry the weight of their find. The lid of the can cracked open, revealing the edge of a single gold coin. Wow, a gold coin. They returned to the site with some other hand tools to see if they could find anything else. They found another can about a foot away, where the first can was discovered. Although it was partially decomposed due to rust, it held several more gold coins. They continued to return to the site to look for more coins, primarily digging in the ground and eventually using a metal detector. And their work eventually resulted in the discovery of eight cans filled with 1,427 gold coins. Wow, what a find in the backyard. That's an amazing story. Stay tuned for the rest of the story. The one thing, the one thing that our church needs most, the one thing that every church needs most is God is our guest. And he's already told us that we're two or three are gathered together. He is in the midst of us. You see, God himself may choose to visit a certain place. And by the way, I, I want to be, be where my father is, don't you? I want to be where God's working. I don't want to be in a dead place. We talk about some mega churches and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. They're about a zillion miles wide, about a half inch deep. They're so shallow because they're not giving the gospel. They're not, they're not, they're not teaching doctrine. By the way, they, they, tell the, they tell the pastors, don't preach on hell, don't preach on doctrine. Just give people what they want to hear. Let them come and let them come and, and you'll build a great work and it's going to be great and wonderful for you. But see, I, I don't really have interest in being a part of a church that meets. I have great interest in being a part of a church that works for the Lord Jesus Christ for His glory and honor. A working church that is committed to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, serving Him, not just coming together to meet, to fellowship, to have fun, and to get fed like a sponge to sit and soak, but no, to, to go out and serve Him and to win a lost and dying world of Jesus Christ. That's what God's called us to do. And I want to be in a place where God is working. And he will choose to specifically work in a certain place. That's what God does. He also will choose to work within a certain people. And by the way, I want to keep company with the kind of people that God will work in and through. And I hope that's your desire. You know, we have to keep company. We like to choose friends, but I, why do we want to choose friends that don't want to, anything to do with God and His work? I told you I was saved at an altar like this altar right about here 36 years ago tonight. Trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. If you were to find me 37 years ago, I could tell you right now, never in a zillion years would I thought I would ever be standing in a pulpit in Greenville, South Carolina, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when God saved me, He gave me the desire to be with God's people. That wasn't something that Todd invented. That's something that God put in my heart. He gave me a love for my brothers and sisters because we're family. And quite honestly, I think you, most of you know this is true. In most cases, we're closer to our brothers and sisters in Christ than we are to our own earthly kin. Because we're eternal. We're bonded eternally. We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We are brothers and sisters washed in the blood of the Lamb, saved by the Lord Jesus Christ in His blood and brought into His family, the children of God forevermore. 
We're His. And God chooses to work through a certain people. And I want to be with that kind of people. God works through in a certain place with a certain people and God works for a certain purpose. So I want to be with the kind of people and the kind of place where I'm, you can hear God working. People that are going to listen to the Word of God and then obey it. And serve the Lord with a loving, tender heart. See, the Lord Jesus Christ came into this home and one was so busy, she forgot who was, who was there. She was so upset, so, so intent on making sure that everybody had what they needed, she forgot that God was there. She enjoyed the fellowship so much. She had friends there, people that she loved, and she wanted to impress them so much with a nice meal and a nice place and all the cleanliness of it. And she forgot that God was there. The one thing we need most, every time we come through these doors, church, we need God to be our most treasured guest. And we need to worship and adore the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Point number two, this is our nature. Point number two is simple. Many things, many things will draw us away from the one thing we need most. You, you've heard it said, the greatest enemy of the ministry is the, the ministry. You know, we've got stuff going on. We've got to take care of kids, children, all the ministries and the music and the choir and, and the upkeep of the church and, and we've got to make sure it's all done right. And praise God, we do because it, it deserves to be done right. It's His work. But the point of what we're finding the Lord Jesus say to this dear precious lady is very simple. She was distracted. The Bible says in verse 40, but Martha was cumbered about much serving. You think, well, that's a good thing. She's serving. She loves the Lord. She loves people. She's hospitable. But she was cumbered about much. She was distracted. There are new laws coming out all the time about distracted driving. You may be guilty of breaking some of those laws. I can tell you that I drive about 70,000 miles a year, and I'm a very distracted driver, so I'm guilty, guilty, guilty. I can't raise all four, but I'm guilty most of the time of being distracted because there's so much to do. It, it's mind-boggling, though. You go to, go to Chicago, or now even Tennessee, when you cross into Tennessee, you can't be on your cell phone. It's got to be hands-free. You go to Chicago, you can't be on a phone at all. You just can't be on the phone. You, you cannot be on the phone. There's distracted because people should be driving and not distracted. It's, it's kind of funny to me, though. I'll just kind of pick on this. It's, it's a little comical that I, I can't be on a phone talking to someone about a business matter, but somebody can have their 35-pound dog over their arm and drive down the road. And that's not distracted. Help me understand that's not being distracted when puppy's licking in the mouth and you're trying to drive. Okay. That's distracted driving if you ask me. But just Martha was so distracted she couldn't even see that Jesus Christ, the one who loved her so dearly, was in her midst, in her home. By the way, let me say once again, where two or three are gathered, he said, there I am in the midst of them. He used the phrase in the New Testament many times, the church in thy house. Husband, wife, if you know the Lord, that's two. In your home, Jesus Christ is in the midst of you. Where two or three are gathered in my name, the church in thy house. So it's not just for the church house to remember, but as we serve the Lord Jesus and want to honor the Lord Jesus in our lives, let's remember he is our most honored guest. He should be our most honored guest and, and we should always be seeking to glorify Him and not allow the distractions of life, the troubles of life, to take our focus off of Him. His focus. She was cumbered about much. She had a disturbed spirit. She was troubled. She was, he said, you're careful and troubled about many things. She was all stirred up. 
We come to church and, you know, the, uh, we know this. Satan is in Sunday mornings. Of, of, all, of all the days, he's always in Sunday mornings. He's trying to keep us from coming to church with the right spirit. Isn't it funny, though? You, you get the kids, no matter if they're little tots or the bigger they get. You know, you get them all ready to go to church and you throw them in the car. You, you run out and say, oh, no, I forgot my Bible. Oh, you run back in. You, oh, and then she forgets her purse. And then, you know, Johnny forgets something and you're just... We just got to get to church and you finally, you're, you're pulling the church on two wheels, slam on the brakes and you get out and you say, I love Jesus. <laughs> We're all so spiritual. We walk in, hey brother, how are you? God's been so good to me. And we've just about lost our spirituality, just almost lost our salvation on the way to church. That's just the way things are in this thing called serving God. We get this disturbed spirit. We let all these things come in. When we come in here, you've got so many things, so many burdens, ministries to care for, children to raise, a nation that's in trouble. And we allow all of these other distractions to keep us from worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing we need most. The one thing Let me talk just for a moment about the deceitfulness of scurry. Think about Martha. Oh, is this chair in the right place? Oh, it's just got to be just right. And she's all over the place. She's making sure everything's straight and, oh, everything's all clean and making sure the green beans are right and, oh, the corn's in good shape. The biscuits aren't being burnt. Oh, it's all good. And she's so, oh, she's so busy. She's all over the place because she's got guests at her home and, and, and we get so busy and we, we can excuse Worshiping Christ because we're so busy. We get so busy with things that we fail to worship the Lord Jesus, and church becomes church. It becomes an activity, a part of what we do. It's, it's a part of our DNA, what we've been raised in. No, listen, the glorious King of Kings has come to be our guest. And that's the one thing we need most is His presence and to worship Him and to bow at His precious feet and honor Him and glorify Him. Many things will draw us away from the one thing we need most. Finally, I'll give you point number three as you go with me to the book of John, chapter 4. In John chapter 4, we see this wonderful, sweet, sweet story of our Savior. His beautiful, wonderful compassion. Going somewhere where He didn't really belong. Talking to someone that He really shouldn't be talking to, legally speaking. This troubled woman. Oh, and she was a woman of a lot of trouble. I mean, she had a, a marred past. In John 4, look with me in verse number 6. Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. By the way, he's in a what? A certain place. And here comes a certain woman. It's amazing how he loves us, how he's always seeking. He's got a purpose. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask us drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said, saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, 
Neither come hither to draw. And Jesus begins to probe her heart then. He said, go call thy husband and come, in, and come hither. And she answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In other words, you're living in sin right now. In that saidest thou truly, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She brings up this, this discussion of worship of God. The Lord Jesus Christ then says in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. He said, because ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I'm going to read these verses again, verses 23 and 24, and ask you just to mark some of these phrases that are very profound. Some things that we have, by the way, forgotten in our day and age about the worship of God and what it means to truly worship. You see, it seems that even the world's gone mad. The world can embrace praise and worship when there's some rock and roll in there, when there's something that pleases the flesh. But I can just tell you the, the true fact is that when we're pleasing our flesh, we are not pleasing the Spirit of God who dwells within us. The Lord Jesus said this, not me. The Lord Jesus Christ taught this, not me. He said in verse 23, The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, you might want to underline that in your Bible, the true worshipers, not just those who were in the flesh or in the place, but Truly worshiping, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And by the way, what is the truth? You're holding it in your hands. So when you come into a place and they're preaching or teaching something other than this, they're teaching the latest fad. Uh, they're, they're opening up a newspaper and, and teaching something that came out of the newspaper off the television or some late philosophy that embraces everything that's anti-Christ. That is not worshiping in spirit and in truth. He said, the Father, you must worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. That's amazing to me. That is mind-boggling to this small mind of mine. There's not much there, but it's still mind-boggling. That a high and holy, glorious God would have to seek someone to worship Him in spirit and in truth. When we know Him, we know His truth. We've, in, we've embraced His truth. We've accepted His truth. We've learned of His truth. We've studied His truth. We've tried to obey His truth, but He's still seeking such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And He defines this by saying in verse 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So regardless of what the world says about worship and praise, we know that we must, when we enter these doors, seek one thing most. The worship in truth of the truth. The way, the truth, and the life, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one thing we need most. Back in Luke chapter 10, I'll draw your attention to verse number 41. Luke 10, verse 41. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Many things draw us away from the one thing. But he said in verse 42, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part. Point number three tonight is simple. Choosing the one thing. 
not choosing to come to be with friends, not choosing to come and be in, just be in church, not choosing to go because you're supposed to go, not choosing to come because these are, this is your crowd, not choosing to come because we're having a good meal on Sunday or a good evangelist or a great pastor, but choosing the one thing, to worship the Lamb of God, the one who loved me and gave himself for me. And putting everything else aside, the cares of the past week, the cares of the future week, the cares of today, the cares of my ministry, the cares, even if I'm preaching the Word of God, if I, as a preacher of the Word of God, I overlook worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, I failed miserably. I've given up an opportunity to worship the one who is in the midst of us. You see, the one thing is the needful thing. He said, Mary has chosen that needful thing. One thing is needful. The priority of, listen, please, listen. The priority of the Savior over your service to the Savior. Please understand that. The priority of looking at Jesus versus your service for Him. Just simply coming before your Savior and worship and adoration and not just embracing your ministry from my ministry. The one thing is not just the needful thing, it's the good thing. It's the proper thing. It's the privileged thing that God Almighty said I would visit, He would visit with us. And it's also the one thing is, is a secure thing because see, as much as we want to serve the Lord, there was a, a funeral here yesterday of a, a precious brother who served the Lord. He honored the Lord with his life. He and his wife have walked diligently and faithfully and served the Lord. I didn't have the privilege to know him. I wish I had. But his service is ended. But the worship that he's given the Lord Jesus Christ will carry on forever. Our service will end. But as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of glory, we're doing the one thing the church needs most. Don't, we can't let all of the activities and all of our ministries and all the things of life crowd out that God has come to visit with us. The Saddle Ridge Horde. These folks had gone out in their backyard many times, walked their dog right by these buckets that were laying in the yard. We need it all around it. And there's that old bucket again. Boy, it won't move. All this gold laying in their backyard, 1,427 pieces of gold from the gold rush. The Saddle Ridge Collection is the largest known discovery of buried gold that has ever been reco recovered in the United States. In total, this hoard contained, in face value, $27,000 in $20 coins, $500 in $10 coins, and $20 in $5 coins, all dating back to 1847 to 1894. The face value of those 1,427 coins totaled $27,980 in their backyard. But wait, that's from 1849. The value today, over $10 million. What an amazing treasure. And it was right there in their midst. The Lord Jesus Christ husband and wife, and you go home right there in your midst. When you're in your car, right there in your midst. Moms and children, that's two or more, right, he's right there in your midst. When we come here together, he's right in our midst, and yet we walk right by him. We just overlook him, and we're too busy for him. Our ministry is so much more important than, than our worship of him. Oh, let's not overlook 
ever again that when we come together, we're two or more gathered together, He is in the midst of us. And He's worthy to be worshipped. Oh, let's serve Him. Let's serve Him faithfully, but let's never overlook the one thing that every church needs most. Let's pray. Almighty, eternal God, oh God, how would you ever love sinners the way you love sinners? But you love sinners. Not only that you love us, Father, but that you seek us. And Lord, even when you save us, you still seek us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we find ourselves so often in Martha, so cumbered about, so anxious about all we have to get done for thee, all the while forgetting that we have the privilege to worship thee and to sit at thy feet in glorious adoration and love and tenderness. Oh God, I pray you to remind us of who you are and who we are in thee, the bride of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray you'd help us to keep the main thing in our lives, the main thing, the one thing most needful, God as our guest. Help us, Lord, we get so busy, so diligent, and the many things will draw us away from the one thing. And Lord, I pray you'd remind us as we depart from this place, as we prepare and come back to this place, as we gather one with another in a, in a restaurant for fellowship, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them, you said. And oh God, help us that we would always give you preeminence in everything we say and in everything we do as thy people. Oh God, bless and be with Pastor tonight. I pray to raise him up, give him healing, give him comfort. Bless Miss Jenny as she's there by his side. God, give her grace tonight as well. I pray, God, for this church, for the precious folks here, thy, thy sheep. We praise you, Lord, for the fellowship of the saints. We thank you that we belong to thee, and, Lord, you belong to us. We are your children by faith in Christ. We give you all the glory for that. Remind us, Lord, of all we have in thee, and help us to walk in thee. And Lord, as we gather, always gathering to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your attention to God's Word. I don't...